morning, everyone. How are we going today? We're good, good. Well, it's very, uh, we're, we're not as far forward as uh, we could be, if I can say that, uh, with all love. It would be nice if we could, you know, move away a bit forward next week. But I want to introduce Mr. and Mrs. Chris and Lauren Ashworth, who were married last week. So stand up, guys. <laughs> Wonderful. Great to have you with us. Had the privilege of officiating their wedding last week. It was a beautiful uh, time together and great that you can be with us uh, today. Wonderful. Very good. So we're in this series um, around uh, deeper faith and our theme this year is around how do we go deeper with the Lord? We really sense that God is wanting to take us on a journey of depth. And, and actually explore what it looks like and what it means to have uh, more of a, a deeper life in Him and with Him, uh, really significant. And it might be something that you think about often, or it might be something that, you know, you don't think about a lot, but we want to invite you into how could God take you deeper on a journey of both prayer and intimacy into faith and obedience, and that's the work that we're really sensing that the Lord uh, wants to do uh, in our lives uh, over this year. And I don't know about you, uh, but I look back on my life and I'm so grateful for the people who have invested into me. Uh, the people that maybe uh, I didn't ask, uh, but they took initiative and they maybe saw something in me and they stepped towards me, maybe asked me good questions, uh, asked to um, go for a drink or a catch up and, and asked me how I'm going in my faith and my journey. And I remember back to uh, my younger years and as I was laying some foundations of faith, those that would step towards me, ask good questions, kind of pull me in close. And I wonder who those people uh, were for you or who are those people who are, they are for you now uh, as you uh, journey through life and faith. I remember my uh, first uh, youth leader, his name was Scott, and, uh, and he was the first person that really opened up the Bible with me in a way that I understood. I remember being invited uh, into his um, home and into a Bible study group and would open up the Word. And I, I didn't even, you know, I'd kind of grown up in a church environment, but I didn't really know how it all kind of worked. And, and he would kind of step us through it and he'd, he'd introduce me to reading the Scripture. And with a little group of guys, we'd explore what it meant as teenagers at that time to uh, live out our faith and understand God's plans for our lives. And it was really formational. I remember when I was 18, 19 years old, I wanted to, um, you know, I had this desire in my heart to grow and develop in my, uh, in my relationship with God and to explore prayer and, and, and gifts of the Holy Spirit and explore more of that. And then God brought this person across my path. His name was Paul. And Paul was a missionary and he was in Clovercrest for a short amount of time before going over uh, to Thailand. And he uh, really took uh, an interest in me, stepped towards me and, in, and invited me into different opportunities to pray for people or to uh, go uh, on, on a different um, uh, trips with him as he would go and speak at different places. And he just kept stepping me more into the things of God. And I'm so grateful for that. As God was laying some foundations in my life, that people would take that initiative and, and step uh, towards me and, uh, and, and help me grow and learn in this time. And I wonder uh, who are those people for you? And this is a good picture for us because this is essentially what Paul's doing in this letter uh, to the church in Thessalonica. Uh, he's taking a big step towards them. If you want a picture, if you're an image person, he's given them a big hug. He's stepping towards them and he's wrapping his arms around this little baby church. Uh, this church of less than uh, two years old, and he's wrapping his arms around them. And it's like he's taking this big step towards them. And he's wanting to deposit into this community some foundational aspects of what it means to follow Jesus and some really important elements of what it means to be church and to go deeper in their faith. And we've learned a bit about that already. You know, Roger, great message in the first week, and he talked about a deep faith is a flourishing faith with enduring hope and a growing love. And then last week, Ash took us on the journey of chapter two, where uh, in, it's really the core text of the letter where there was a false report that Jesus has already returned. And some people in the church are like, what's going on? And Paul's like, hey, let me clear some things up. And he spoke about the day of the Lord. And he said, the day of the Lord, this is how we know when this is happening. And it hasn't happened yet. And the encouragement was to stand firm and to hold on to hope. So what Paul is doing here 
Uh, it's important for the church in the first century, but as important for us to understand today as he's taking a big step towards, he's wrapping his arms around this little church and he's stepping towards it and he's saying, these are some things that you need to know as you consider what a life in Christ is like in community. Another way to say that is going deeper in faith. So we're into the third uh, chapter is the final chapter of this short letter. And we're wanting to know, how do we go deeper? How do we grow in our faith? So if you've got your Bibles, your phones, uh, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. If not, just follow with me on the screens. Verse 1 to 5 says this, As for other matters, because he's just been talking about standing firm, uh, holding on to hope, uh, speaking about the day of the Lord. So now it goes, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured just as it was with you. And pray that we might be delivered from wicked and evil people, not for, for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord uh, that you're doing and will continue to do the things that we command. And may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. So at the end of uh, chapter 2, as I just mentioned, Paul's encouraging this church to stand firm and to have hope. And then he says that he is praying for them, for him and his team. So Timothy and, and Silas and Paul, they are praying for this young church. And that's his heart that's coming across. And then he says in verse 1 and 2 here of chapter 3, he says, will you pray for us? We're praying for you, but would you pray for us? Would you do that? And, uh, and, and, he, and he asked that they would pray for them, that the message of Jesus may spread and that they may experience God's favor and protection. And this is really important that we understand this, that Paul was genuinely interested in gospel partnership. This is what his heart's desire was. He was stepping towards this young church. He was wrapping his arms around it, but he was genuinely keen and his heart's desire was to be in relationship and gospel partnership. He said, we're praying for you, but would you pray for us? There was a mutuality involved in this. Uh, Paul didn't in any way uh, want this church to think, hey, we've arrived. This is what you need to be. You just need to be like me and we're all going to be okay. He wanted them to know that he is on a journey of faith as well. And that his team uh, is on a journey of faith uh, together. And like, like I mentioned, at the time of writing this letter, uh, the Thessalonian church was just a baby, only a couple of years old. And, and Paul is really like a spiritual father to this young church plant. He's showing care, he's showing initiative, and he's showing love by reaching out and stepping towards them. And he desires this partnership. And he wants them to know that he has a lived faith. He's in the trenches with them. And his confidence and his assurance and the ability for him to persevere and keep moving forward is because of the faithfulness of God. I love verse 3. And we've been worshipping in this theme of the faithfulness of God today. But Paul says in verse 3, But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Sometimes it's good to cross-reference Paul's letters with uh, where he was in Acts at the time. You can go to Acts uh, 17, 18, and you can kind of pick up this story because Paul's just finished his second uh, missionary journey. He's in Corinth where he stays for a year and a half before he goes off onto his third missionary journey. And that's where he's writing this uh, letter from. And he's writing on his own journey where he's saying, I'm wanting to grow in faith. I'm wanting to see the gospel spread. I've had these two missionary journeys and he's looking to the third one of where God is leading and guiding him in this time. But he's planted in Corinth uh, as he is writing uh, this letter. And Paul is living in the faithfulness of God. Paul has a lived example of what it means to live in the faithfulness of God for strength and protection. And he wants to pass this on to this young church, that they have a foundation piece that they understand around the faithfulness of God, that they can live with the same confidence and have the same perseverance that Paul is talking about. And essentially what Paul is saying here is he's saying that a deep faith is a growing faith. 
A deep faith is a growing faith, growing in prayer, that, that we would ask people to pray for us, but then we would pray for others. There's a mutuality in that. And relying on the faithfulness of God for confidence and for perseverance. A deep faith. If we're wanting to go deeper with the Lord, then we need to understand that's a growing faith. None of us have arrived. We never make it. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> There's not a pill that you can take or, you know, something that can happen that just says, yes, I have arrived. It doesn't work like that, participating with God. It's about growing and cultivating that soft heart, about looking to see where you can serve and bless and grow as the Lord is working in and through. So a deep faith is a growing faith. Each year at the start of the year here at Clovey, we have a prayer and fasting season. And, uh, and when we asked for some feedback around that in our services, an email went out, we've, um, we've collated all of that and we've discerned and asked the Lord, what are you saying to us as a church as we go on a journey of growing? Uh, we want to be people of faith. We want to be people that when God speaks to us, we respond in our heart and our desire is yes. And, and God's spoken some things into us as a church that I want to share uh, with you now. And there's a slide that will come up on the screen. The, and this is the, the, the really the feedback that's come from the church around the things, the, the key themes that are coming through in the life of Clovey. The first one is around trusting in God. I've had a number of people, particularly after Michelle's message around trusting in God, having a focus and a faith that God is speaking about how do we put our trust in Him? How do we not, uh, you know, maybe trade on the past, but how do we put our trust in God for the now? It's getting increasingly difficult to live out our faith in an increasingly secularized environment that we live in. Yet the openness to the gospel seems like it's growing more than ever. Last year, we gave away 386 Bibles to people in the community who are seeking to know the truth. That is reality. Yet there are some decisions being made uh, from the government down that's making it um, tricky to live out our faith. So how do we trust God to know that he is sovereign, to know that he is faithful? And that was a theme coming through, that we would surrender to God with our whole heart. The second was that we'd be a people of prayer. That we'd be a people of prayer, devoted, persistent, and expectant. And that fits right into what Paul's saying here. Hey, we're praying for you, but would you pray for us? We want to grow in that prayer and that intimacy, that, that, that inner life and that communion with God. We want to know, God, what you're saying. And we want to have the courage to obey. And thirdly, to be a people who live on mission, that we have courage, that we're bold, that we're in the marketplace with the love and the message of Jesus, and that we are spirit-led. So these were the three key themes, trusting in God, being a people of prayer, and living on mission. And if there was a summary to, to pull that together, it is, earnestly seek God's heart together, expectantly trust Him and courageously obey the Holy Spirit's voice. If you ask me the kind of church that I'd like to be a part of, I think it's that one. I think it's that one. Uh, I think it's fair to say we don't want to just play games, do we? We just don't want to go through the motions. We don't want to just tick the box and oh yeah, on Sundays I go to church. That's what I do. But it doesn't impact us or it doesn't change us, or it doesn't transform us to be more like Jesus. The type of church, the, the people, the body that really interests me is a, is a church that would earnestly seek God's heart together, expectantly trust Him, and courageously obey the Holy Spirit's voice. And guess what? That came from you. That's us. That's the, the themes and the patterns of what God is doing in us as a church. Now, I'd be very encouraged about that. I hope you are. I hope you're encouraged that you're part of a faith community that wants to trust God more, that wants to pray more, and wants to be obedient and live on mission into the things of God. And that essentially, my friends, is what it means to have a growing faith, no matter what age or stage you find yourself in, that we bring ourselves before God and we say, God, we know you're faithful. And we know that you've got a good plans. You want to strengthen and protect us and you want to lead us forward. So deep faith is a growing faith. 
And Paul goes on in verse 6 to 13, and he says this. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this not because we do not have the right for such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. And such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and to earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire in doing what is good. So after Paul's encouragement, verse 1 to 5, to pursue partnership, uh, then he calls this young church to follow their example in verse 7 regarding work and not being a burden to others. It's a bit of a gear shift, really, in many, many ways, isn't it? And Paul's concerned that there are people uh, in this uh, young church that are taking advantage of others. They're being disruptive and they're being idle. And he uses this word idle three times. And the Greek uh, meaning for this means disorderly. There are people that are just causing disruption, looking for their own gain. They're not looking for the welfare of others, but they're looking for what they can have. Uh, essentially, you know, in our context today, we probably say there's some people that are maybe a little bit tight. They're not giving into the community. Maybe they're takers and they're kind of sucking the oxygen out of the room a little bit. And they've got to think about how can they give a little bit more? How can they serve a little bit more? How can they add uh, to the flavor of the community rather than taking away from it? And from verses 7 to 9, Paul shares his own experience here, one of a genuine and authentic experience of how his team, so Timothy, Silas, and himself, work to support themselves. And this is the model for this young church to follow. And he adds in verse 13, never tire of doing what is good. See, Paul's desire here is that they work hard and they support themselves, yes, but they keep a soft heart and an openness to say yes to the things of God and a discernment around seeking to care for the other. And I think what Paul is teaching us here, he's teaching us that a deep faith takes responsibility. As we grow in our faith, as we mature, we actually take responsibility of our faith, seeking to support one another, keep one another accountable, not tiring doing good, yet not allowing disruptive people to bring disunity into the community. So how does Paul teach us here uh, how to take responsibility and deepen our faith? Well, from verses 7 uh, to 13, he gives us four uh, practical kind of ways about how we can deepen our faith and take responsibility. And I think this works. I think it's a bit of a, a theology of responsibility, actually, a bit of a theology of working out our faith uh, and understanding of what God is doing in that midst. And whether you're uh, applying this to your workplace or your family, or you uh, uh, put this lens over how you approach your service and ministry in the life of the church. I just think Paul gives us a little framework, which is, I think is helpful uh, around how he goes about this. The first uh, aspect of this, how do we take responsibility and deepen our faith? He says, work hard, earn your way. Wherever you find yourself, work hard. Work hard and earn your way. In verse 7, he says, For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle, not disorderly, disruptive when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. In verse 10, For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. See, Paul's encouraging a strong work ethic. And I think for us uh, today as well, we'd be wise to hear that, that wherever we find ourselves, whether it's at work, uh, whether it's in our family, whether it's in a ministry context and we're volunteering, work hard, do your best, bring your best. And don't let others sort of do it for you, but actually bring your best and step towards it. And the second thing he says is to model this to others. In verse nine, he says, we did this not because we have the right for such help, 
but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. So we have this uh, wonderful opportunity as we take responsibility and deepen our faith to model that to others. Uh, We can be an example. Be an example for people who are younger than us in the faith maybe. Be an example for us uh, to people who don't yet have faith. People in your family, people in your workplace, maybe know you're a follower of Jesus and they're watching to see how you react in certain situations. They're seeing, maybe even, you know, unfairly testing you out at times. But how do you react when you work hard and then you be an example to others? You model that to others. It's a good thing for us to be considering in the places in which we find ourselves. The third thing he says is keep each other accountable. Verses 11 and 12. He says, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They're not busy. They're busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food that they eat. Sometimes we need to be in accountable relationships. Why? Because sometimes we need to settle down. (laughs) Sometimes we might just get carried away, all of us, in different contexts, in different environments. Maybe the passion comes out or maybe we're just over it. And we need to be in accountable relationships so that people can maybe remind us of the why or bring us back to the things of God. And we're encouraged not to step away, but to step back in to what God has for us. And Paul is fairly direct and he's strong with his approach here. Yet we all need people in our lives in a trusted way who call us to more and ask us the hard questions. And we talk about that a bit here. One of the key bits of research that came out of my demon, my doctoral studies, is supported accountable relationships and being in accountable relationships so that we can step into the things of God when some of those challenges that come to all of us do arise in our lives. And the fourth part of the framework here is look to serve others. He says, and as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire in doing what is good, even in the midst of giving a hard word. Now, Paul ensures uh, that he encourages this young church not to tire from what is right and doing good. And as the Holy Spirit leads us to become more like Jesus, we can uh, make the world a better place as we participate with him in the restoration of all things, as we look to serve others. So he gives us this framework of taking responsibility for our faith. Let's be a people that work hard. Let's be a people who model and set an example to others. A people who are in accountable relationships and we look to serve the other. You know, the beautiful thing about Clovey is that there are so many people in the life of the church that emulate that that, and are an example in that. And there's one man uh, in our church who's uh, uh, into his 90s now. He's just sitting over here. His name's Owen Williams. And Owen, I just want to honor you today in how you set the example to others. Owen spent his life working hard in and outside of the church. Wonderful example to others. You're in accountable relationships. You're part of the Tuesday crew and in a life group where you wrestle with your faith as you've gone through uh, the loss of your wife and, and as you've gone through different life experiences. You haven't given up on God and he hasn't given up on you. And then you look to serve other people relentlessly. Owen made our giving boxes here last year. Into his 90s, he made another one for Gawler and a donation box over at Pathway, using the skills and the gifts that God's given you. So I want to honor you today, Owen, that you have taken responsibility for your faith. So thank you for setting the example to us. Can we just honor Owen? And I want to be like you. And I, and I hope others do, that we have people in our lives that we look up to and we, we want to be like them because we see God's work in their lives. And that is my hope and that is my desire for you as well as we seek to live a deep faith. And Paul concludes this letter by saying in verses 16 to 18, he says, Now may the Lord of peace... Himself give you peace at all times and in every way. And the Lord be with you all. And I, Paul, I write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. 
And this is Paul's finishing thought as he concludes this short letter to this young church. He says, a deep faith experiences God's peace. A deep faith experiences God's peace. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. You know, God's peace, God's shalom, it's more than uh, simply the absence of conflict, but it's the making right of all things. It's how things were intended to be when God made them in the first instance. And that is God's peace. That is God's shalom. And I wonder today, where do you need God's peace in your life? Where is it that there is a heart desire in you to make things right in your life, to experience God's peace? Now, Paul says here, he says, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, not sometimes, but at all times and in every way. God's heart is for his peace to be with you 24-7, in and through every bit of your life. And that's the invitation for us to go deeper with the Lord. This is a growing faith that takes responsibility, but experiences a deep peace from God. I just want to invite you just to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to think of a current situation that requires God's peace. Probably won't be hard. It's probably right there, front of mind. Just think about that situation that requires God's peace, God's shalom. I want to give you an opportunity to invite God into that situation. Just invite Him in to that situation now. And as you're breathing, just take attention of your breathing. Pay attention. Uh, as you breathe in, breathe in the peace of God. As you breathe out, breathe out the worries that you hold. Breathe in the peace of God and breathe out the worry. Breathe in His peace, His shalom. Breathe out your worry and concern. Paul says in verse 16, May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. As you attend to your breathing, I also want you to picture Jesus in a way that makes sense to you, stepping towards you and wrapping his arms around you like Paul wrapped his arms around this church. Receive his warm embrace as he steps towards you lovingly. And he speaks words of life and words of love into you. Receive his peace today. Friends, a deep faith is a growing faith. It takes responsibility and it lives in the peace of God. Amen. Amen. We stand with me. We're going to respond to the Lord. We're going to continue into this theme of the faithfulness of God. Let's worship Him together.